Well, hello everybody. My name is Louise Savage. Welcome to my channel, Louise Savage Muses. I've chosen um, what, on the surface of it, rightly so, is a is a very gloomy and um, uh, serious topic theme um, for today's um, recording. But the reason I've done that, I think, is because obviously, you know, a lot of us. It doesn't matter whether you're Ukrainian, whether you're Russian, whether you're, you know, anybody. Um, at the moment witnessing what's happening um, over in the Ukraine is going to be affected by it. Um, now, I've got mixed feelings about that because obviously there are wars going on in, in, in parts of the world all the time. Um, but as a European citizen, um, I suppose the fact that it's within um, Europe, on the borders of Europe, make it very um what's the word not real but just um it feels more yeah no it does it feels more real i don't know why i'm hesitating um which is really sad isn't it actually when you think about it because um you know we ought to be i ought to be more conscious of uh war existing you know, in, in lots of different places across the world. Anyway, uh, enough of that. The the thing about reading, of course, is that it enables empathy. Um, it's one of, the, for me, it's probably the most significant reason why we read, because it takes us to different places, different times. We meet lots of different people who um, actually can become our friends in a, you know, those of you, well, you wouldn't be watching this if you didn't love books. So I'm, I'm assuming you, you understand what I mean by that. And I think it prepares us for things. It prepares us for, you know, the, the sort of um, calamities that we might experience um, in our lives. And as somebody who's, you know, suffered a, a fair few knocks um, in my personal life over the years, I think one of the reasons that I've been able to be resilient is because uh, of of having read voraciously as a as a young child. Um, so I do think reading books about war is really important, and I think probably some of the most classic literature um, has has centred around war. It starts with the Iliad, doesn't it? Um, which is Homer's take on the war between the Greeks and the Trojans in the ancient world. But today I'm going to choose, uh, I've chosen a few books that um, I feel deal with a whole range of different aspects of war, um, but are really strong narratives. Um, and uh, very often, actually, I realise that when people are writing about war, they don't just focus on the tragedy. They focus on humour. Um, they focus on uh, hope and and lots of those qualities that allow us to survive these things. So the first up, um, I don't know whether this is a book that people don't pick up anymore, but I do remember it's it's a novel called Captain Corelli's Mandolin by Louis de Bernier. I, I do love this cover. I think it's really vibrant. And I think it emerged in the early 90s. And from what I can remember, it was one of the first books that kind of spread by word of mouth. People just raved about it. And I don't think the publishers were expecting it to be such a success, but it became a, a firm favourite. You know, if you asked everybody, anybody what they'd read recently at the time, or uh, I think for years afterwards, very often people would quote it as being their favourite book. It has since been made into a film, which personally, I don't think feel that film captures the novel um, Certainly not the version that's in my head. Um, but, you know, again, um, it's a hard journey, isn't it, to make from novel to film. Uh, and it's very rare that I think the film is better than the book. So Captain Corelli is about a, a, an Italian um, soldier. Um, he has a, a mandolin, or, as mentioned in the title, which she actually calls Antonia. She has a name and uh, and he plays it uh, beautifully for the entertainment of the soldiers. Um, he's with a group of soldiers who are presented as being quite carefree. They march into Greece. They're, they base, they're based in um, Kefalonia in Greece. It's 1941 um, during the Second World War and they are the, the army of occupation. So it's no surprise that the villagers 
uh, living it because it focuses on village life, which is one of the things I love about it. It's no surprise that the villagers don't take too kindly um, to these Italian soldiers and the characters are kind of determined not to like them, which, you know, makes eminent sense. Um, however, living within that village are Dr. Yanis and his daughter Pelagia, and, or Pelagia, I suspect, um, and she's he's brought her up to be really independent and resilient and forceful because he knows about war and he suspects she might have to, you know, um, wage her own war um, against any sort of invading force. So she's this very determined young woman. Um, the opening scene of the novel is one of the funniest I've ever read. I remember just crying with laughter after the first couple of pages. It's a scene involving the doctor. Um, helping a very elderly patient. I'm not going to say any more because it would spoil it. Um, in, in some ways it's worth reading for that scene alone and there, there is lots and lots of humour in this in this novel, some very funny scenes. Um, but equally there's a lot of tragedy and realism. Um, so there's a story of, of unrequited love. There's a young man, young soldier who falls in love with Captain Corelli, a male soldier, and of course he can't make his love known um, and he actually, and I don't think this is a spoiler, um, he actually saves Corelli's life. Um, Pelagia has a, a fiancé, I think he's called Mandras, and he goes off to fight in the war and she sends him letters all the way through the war which he never replies to. But ultimately he returns as a wounded soldier and that's kind of the, the, their love story, in inverted commas, and then a love story develops involving Corelli himself, a kind of the the crux of the novel. Uh, and it's a very, very beautifully, poignantly romantic novel, I think. Um, so so Pelagia um, ends up um, nursing Mandras back to health and the description of his wounds, and it, there are no holes barred, it's really quite a, a grim read but again it's taking you close to what it might um, feel like to experience war. Um, all the world is in this novel, um, you know we've got humble characters, we've got um, arrogant characters, we've got all sorts of, of different people, it's very Eurocentric for, for obvious reasons um, but um, but I really really loved reading it at the time and I'm, I'm, I've realised since I picked it up today that I'd quite like to get the audio version and listen to it because um, it's a long time. I read it not long after it came out. Um, anyway, much, much love book. My husband read it too. He absolutely adored it as well. Um, and yeah, it's that focus on, on the resilience of the characters and village life and, uh, and all that brings with it. So that's my first recommended novel focusing on the theme of war. Second up, I suspect, is a much less well-known novel. Um, I picked this up because I really, really love reading about uh, the Middle East. I, I find it fascinating. Um, anybody who enjoyed The Kite Runner, that kind of novel, would, I, I imagine, really enjoy this. So it's called The President's Garden by Mushin Al Ramli. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, who is a he's an Arabic writer and um, he writes in Arabic. And this obviously is a, a translation because I can't read Arabic. I wish I could. And it's set in um, in Iraq. It starts um, just prior to the uh, the the war, uh, the Iraqi war with America, and um, it it ends with. Um, you know, whilst the Americans are still in Iraq. And um, and obviously, you know, that, that war was about the removal of, of Saddam Hussein or weapons of mass destruction or however you want to interpret um, the intervention in that war. But nevertheless, um, the West um, chose to intervene with uh, very mixed consequences. And um, this novel, um, is, I think, probably in some ways non-fiction dressed up as fiction. There's a dedication at the beginning and it's a bit grim, so if you're, you know, it comes with a bit of a health warning, this. 
Um, but it says in the beginning, to the souls of my nine relatives slaughtered on the third day of Ramadan, um, 2006. And the novel starts with, uh, again, it's, a, it, it's centred very much in a village. Um, and in that village, um, one morning, the, the residents wake up and nine banana crates have arrived. And in each of the nine banana crates is an identity document and the he a beheaded head uh, and each of them is a is a relative uh, of somebody in the village so it's a really quite a grim um, opening but it has that wonderful sort of fable like quality to it so you know think Arabian Nights think Shahrazad think about some of the grim things that happen in those stories it has that for me anyway it has that very sort of folk tale style to the narrative which helps you to cope with the the violence and actually this is a story of friendship it's about three friends who uh, all have very different experiences of of the um the war and um the main protagonist i think his name is ishmael if i remember rightly i might have got that wrong um but at one point during the novel it's called the president's garden because he ends up um, going to work in the rose garden that belonged to Saddam Hussein and um, oh I was blown away by the the detail about that because he turns up he doesn't really know what his job's going to be he's desperate for money um, you know war brings poverty doesn't it and he's had to travel to to take this job leave the village behind and um, he turns up and he doesn't really know what his job is he's given a, a, a very specific suit to wear he's given a box with some secateurs and various other things in it and it turns out that his job is to tend the rose garden and um, he's guided around it by somebody who's been working there for a very long time and um, and he just can't believe what he's seeing in the middle of this garden there is a a, a, a sort of house well it is a house and it's been built on this rotating platform so it it rotates so that Saddam Hussein could enjoy whichever roses happen to be in flower. Um, and and there are, you know, the fragrance, he walks in and, and amidst all this war and destruction, there's this incredible fragrance and it's because the fountains are perfumed. Um, so that this, this is a novel full of wonderful characters. There's warmth to it. There are characters who are, uh, really no good <laughs> who get up to all sorts of horrific things um and i just absolutely loved it and i have bought another novel by him i can't remember the name off the top of my head um but i'm really looking forward to reading that i think he, he's written quite a few so i think this um he's going to become one of my my favorite novelists so there we go that's the president's garden loved it Next up is um, Helen Dunmore's The Siege, and I suppose in my mind this probably comes closest to um, what the Ukrainians might be um, experiencing in, in some of those cities right now. Bizarrely, of course, and this is the, the sad thing about war, isn't it, that this is about the siege of Leningrad. Again, I think it's 1941. And um, the Germans have surrounded Leningrad. It's a really, really fierce, fierce winter. Um, I think about 600,000 people lost their lives in that during that siege. And the descriptions of need and poverty and desperation are horrendous. It focuses on um, a family called the Levins and Anna is a 22 year old uh, young woman. She wants to be a, an artist, she wants to pursue her art, but instead She's trapped within this city and um, she's got a young brother who is becoming more and more emaciated and fragile because of hunger. Um, her father, um, who has, has been a writer and um, I think a political activist, I can't quite remember, uh, you know, he's deteriorating because of the situation. And so this young woman is kind of holding the family together. Um, you get descriptions of, of having to burn books to keep warm, um, making soup out of shoe leather you know it's really again it's it, it it's grim in its detail but the hope that that young woman demonstrates and the the way that she manages to cling on um 
and and provide some sort of existence for for the rest of her family is is just um a joy actually and you know it it says an awful lot about the human spirit this novel um so again it's a grim topic i know but comes um highly highly um recommended i love helen dunmore um i haven't read all of her books yet because i spin them out like treats um but yes there we go the siege by helen dunmore Next up um, is Tides of War by Stella um, Tilliard. And um, Stella Tilliard is a, is a historian, but this is a, a work of fiction. Um, although I suspect, you know, the historical research in it is um, pretty accurate. Uh, it's the sort of novel that I love to read because I feel like I find out much more about that historical period um, as a result. So this is the world of Jane Austen um in terms of you know it's regency uh, london where the novel starts um and it focuses on a young couple called harriet and i think he's called james um and they have only just the newlyweds um she's quite quirky for the time and um she's her father is dabbles in science um and she's really enjoys getting involved in her father's experiments they're, they're both from, um, you know, relative well, from wealthy backgrounds, uh, which which is, you know, marks this novel out really from from the others that I've chosen. Um, so this really looks at war from the the sort of more privileged um, classes, and um, so these two newlyweds are very quickly separated because James is goes off to Spain to fight in the Peninsular War with the Duke of Wellington. And uh, the Duke of Wellington's a character in the novel. He's very uh, adulterous, but also, you know, extremely talented. Um, so, you know, it's worth reading really for, for the portrait of him alone. Um, there's a huge cast of characters in this novel. It can be a little bit bewildering. Um, but for me personally, that didn't spoil it at all. Um, so meanwhile, so, so James is off in Spain, um, learning a lot about life, shall we say. Um, uh, but also, of course, experiencing the brutality of war. And um, Hattie, or Hetty, or whatever she's called, Harriet, she's left behind, but she is taken under the wing of the uh, Duke of Wellington's wife, Lady Wellington, I think. Um, and she's decided to sort of vacate the, the family home to go and stay in London for the course of the war. So... The descriptions of London in here are fab. It's a really kind of vibrant place, you know, scientific developments, industrial developments. Um, so there's a kind of almost like a Vanity Fair type feel to some of the exploration of, of London in here. Um, but I found it really interesting because um, there's so much in this about the pressure that war puts on relationships the way that war can be liberating, particularly very often for women. Um, I found it, yeah, really, really um, an, an enjoyable read, despite the subject matter. So there we go, that's Stella Tilliard, Tides of War. And the final novel I've chosen to talk to you about is, again, very well-known novel. Um, I'm sure many of you will already have read it, but if you haven't, wow, you've got a treat in store. Um, so this is Cold Mountain by um, Charles Frazier. Um, and this is set um, during the American Civil War. And um, what's he called? Inman or Ingram? Inman. Um, so the, you've got this um, soldier who um, has been fighting in the war. He's been wounded and um, he's making his way home which happens to be in the deep south um, of america and he's making his way home and this journey takes him a very 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 long time and we follow him on every step of the way which might not sound like the most interesting premise for a novel but what's amazing about this is his drive and his persistence to get back home it's been compared to the odyssey and certainly you know, um, I don't know if you know the word nostos, which is where we get the word nostalgia from. Um, but a nostos is a, is a story of somebody, a hero, usually traveling home um, very often after war. And um, 
and that's exactly what he's doing and he, he meets lots and lots of um, characters on the way um, all sorts of people who are living in horrendous circumstances as a consequence of the war but also slaves women um, people who who trick him and delude him but equally people who show tremendous humanity and, and support and help him um, the landscape is hugely important in this novel and the way that he um, deals with the landscape at times it's his enemy uh, at other times it's his friend uh, and obviously you know he's he's developed all sorts of skills um, as a result of being a soldier so he's traveling home and back at home is southern bell ada who um is the love of his life he's trying to get back to her her life's been turned upside down because of course she's no longer traipsing around in beautiful dresses but she's having to try and um uh, maintain her father's farm so again it focuses on you know how women's lives are changed by war too um and um and through her we kind of reflect on life in the build-up to the war when it was balls and it was you know so you've got this fantastic contrast between the horrendous endurance that the characters are having to demonstrate and um and the 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 sort of their lived past um yeah and and i read this a long time ago i mean again i think it came out in the early 90s i think it was a debut novel and actually i think charles frazier based a lot of this novel on stories that he'd been told by his grandfather that had kind of been handed down so you know again it's it's one of those uh, novels where it, it borders on non-fiction you know where does fiction end and non-fiction begin we could talk about that for a long time um but i found it fascinating and it and it's again i can still see the scenes in my head it still resonates with me um when i when i think back over it and again it's another one where i'm thinking mm, maybe listen to it on audible um because i don't want to i like reading new things but it's lovely, isn't it, to revisit favourite novels from the past. So that's my take on um, novels that, that focus on war. Um, again, it makes me think, it makes me... I mean, there are loads and loads of other books, don't get me wrong, that I could have included in this list, um, but they are the ones that, that leapt out at me from my shelves as I was, as I was um, sailing through them. Um, and I, I'm conscious of the fact that there's a kind of Western bias. Well, I suppose there's, there's the um, the Arabic story there, isn't there? Um, but I think that's perhaps because um, it was the conflict in Ukraine that kind of spurred me to think about doing this. Um, and, you know, we, we've got wonderful novelists um, like Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, for example, who write really well about um, about war. Um, so, you know, I know there are lots of other things that on a different day I might have chosen to talk about, but this, these are the books that I chose to talk about today. Anyway, um, I'm going to leave you now. It's beautiful weather out there. I've got a wasp that needs to be released <laughs> from my window. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to talking you all, to you all again very soon. Take care. Bye.